We are working through the family, and we started off in Genesis talking about how God had designed a relationship specifically between a husband and a wife. We saw that it did not take Adam and Eve very long to mess it up. And we've seen that uh, a number of things came out of that that directly affect the marriage relationship. Uh, in the, the curses that were laid out, we see that there will be contention between men and women. Um, we see that um, ultimately at the root of sin is pride, that, that we think we deserve more than we have, or, or in some cases we think we don't deserve what we've got. Um, and, and there's a, this, this pressing in to more than just being content. And so we see that there's this, this conflict, there's this tension that exists in marriage and as a result of the curse. And we've talked about uh, a little bit about what this came out. And I want to go back to something I talked a little bit about last week. I want to go a little bit more in depth. Um, just so you guys know, I don't know everything. What? I know, crazy, right? <laughs> See, the trick is you don't have to know everything. I just have to know it before you. <laughs> okay? And after church, we were um, back at our house, and Christopher made a comment about, you know, I was talking last week about Lord and how in Scripture, in the, the Hebrew Bible, there's two words that are used for Lord. There's Adon or Adonai, and there's Baal. And we talked a little bit about the difference between the how those two words are used and what they mean. And Christopher said, uh, yeah, um, you know, there's that scripture in Hosea that talks about that. I went, what? And, and uh, so he, he kind of pointed me to Hosea and I started looking. So if you have your Bible, open up uh, to Hosea chapter 2. Now, Hosea is a unique book. Uh, I marvel at the faithfulness of Hosea. <clears throat> because a lot of times God would ask very difficult things of his prophets. Um, laying on your side for months on end, and then turning over and laying on your other side for months on end. Uh, he, he would ask them to do difficult things. Uh, Hosea, I think, was probably asked one of the most difficult things. Uh, the, the way the story lays out, God was using Hosea and his marriage to Gomer as an illustration. Because see, at the root of all of this, marriage between a man and a wife is supposed to be an illustration of the relationship that God wants to have with us. The openness and intimacy that God desires to have with us. And throughout scripture, we see this correlation, this, this parallel between adultery, when one partner in the marriage relationship is unfaithful, and idolatry, when one partner in the God-man relationship is unfaithful. And God correlates the two of these very, very similarly. This is part of how we know that God intended that marriage should reflect the relationship that he desires to have with us. Okay? And uh, if you're not real sure, uh, you know, how does that work, look at the Song of Solomon. Okay? Song of Solomon is an intimate, intimate letter going back and forth between a husband and a wife, and the, the, the lover and the beloved. And uh, I don't think that that would be in there just for the, you know, hee hee reading of your, you know, on the border uh, romance novel. That, that's not what 
Song of Solomon is in there. I think it's a, an incredible illustration for the way a marriage relationship should work. The, the love and the devotion that they have to each other, I think, is something that every relationship, every marital relationship should strive for. But I think beyond that, it's, it's an incredible illustration of the way that God desires to have intimacy with us. Okay? Well, Hosea is kind of the, the flip side of that relationship. If Song of Solomon is, is the way the relationship is supposed to work, Hosea is the way the relationship a lot of times really does work, okay? And so God spoke to Hosea, and he told him to go take an unfaithful wife, an adulterous wife, because this was an illustration of how the people of Israel had uh, committed sin before God and, and worshipped other idols. <clears throat> and then in... Uh, Chapter 2, you know, the thing that's, that's so amazing to me is throughout the prophecies of the Old Testament. Now, keeping in mind, the prophets didn't always foretell events that were coming down the road. That's part of it. But most often, what did prophets do? They foretold. They told the things of God, and they reminded the people where they were in their relationship with God. Okay. So a, a prophet can foretell, but a prophet should always foretell, all right? And so in Hosea, um, God is using this to foretell the dynamic of the relationship between Israel and God and how it had been injured, how it had been damaged, how it was, was in a very bad place. And God wants the relationship back to the way it should be. Okay, so we see throughout the book of Hosea, there's one part that I really want to to uh, share with you, and uh, I'm going to uh, just just hit a couple of verses here real quick. Um, Let's just, just pick up here in, in verse 5. It says, For their mother has played the whore. That's not very nice, is it? You know, it's something that we need to be careful of. Uh, a, a lot of times we strive to be so polite that we miss the heart of the issue. Okay? God is speaking very plainly here. And... This, this understanding of what this woman has done, um, she, she's a harlot, she's a whore, okay? And, and God calls a thing what it is. Um, you know, and, and we've seen in several places where God has used the authors to use words that we normally wouldn't use in regular conversation. We would consider them impolite or uncouth. But, but God always says what he means. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, now this is God speaking, I will hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Okay, so now God is going to take all of these things back. Um, but, but we get down, we're just going to skip down a, a little bit in this passage to verse 16 because I think this is significant here. And in that day, declares the Lord, well, actually, I, I've got to back up because you've got to understand what's happening. Verse 14, therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope 
And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. So, so there's something that we really need to grasp here. When God speaks to the prophets, there's a lot of condemnation that comes out of it. Okay? Because a lot of times the people are doing something that they should not have been doing, and they needed someone to, to get their attention and steer them back to the right path. But always in the prophecies, there's always hope. Even when God said, okay, I'm done. I am taking you out of the land, and I'm scattering you to the winds. There was always hope because it said, a remnant will be saved, and I will bring you back. And the land will flourish once more. Okay, So here's what God is saying. He's, he's cast her out. He's taken away all the things that she thought her lovers had given her. But then he says, I'm going to allure her. Has anybody got a, a, another word that we could use in place of allure? Attract. Attract. He's going to make it attractive, appealing, pleasing. Think about that for a moment. God alluring you drawing you to him. Okay? And then we get down to 16. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. Now see, this last week is exactly what I was talking about. We see in the damaged dynamic of marriage because of sin, we see this contention between a husband and a wife. Now, we see that there were two words in the Hebrew Bible that were used for, for Lord, and we see that Adon or Adonai and, and Baal, they stand in marked contrast to each other. They both mean Lord. Okay? But Baal is a Lord that is not concerned about you. Whereas Adam, in every situation that I could find the word being used in the Bible, it has an understanding of benevolence. Even in discipline, there's benevolence. There's good will toward the beloved. Okay? And right here, God is saying, in that day, when I, when I draw you back out, and I pull you away from all of this nasty garbage crud, and I take you out into the wilderness. Interesting that he's taken her out to the wilderness, isn't it? Because typically, what do we think of the wilderness as? It's not a good place. I mean, you, you go out in the wilderness, and, and uh, you know, you've got to find your own water, you've got to find your own food. Um, it's not somewhere that we typically would choose to go. But God uses the wilderness over and over and over again throughout his word to illustrate that he's the one that takes care of us regardless of where we are. Okay? And think about the children of Israel. Forty years in the desert and their clothes didn't wear out. I'm pretty good at, at keeping my clothes in good shape, but I've had none of them that lasted 40 years. Not with me still being able to fit in them and wear them. Okay? But God draws her out, and then he says, in that day, you're not going to call me Baal. You're going to call me Ishi, husband. Okay? So here's, here's the point that I want to make in this. Because of sin, husbands are going to reflect one of two kinds of lordship. Now, what you reflect is entirely up to you. You can choose to be self-centered, selfish, wanting your way, and you would be Baal. Okay? Or you can choose to put the needs of your spouse before your own, and you can be Adam. Okay? So we see this contention on the, the, the wife's side. We see that, that she is going to pursue a place that is not hers. That's, that's what came out of this sin, the original sin. But we also see that, that 
man, um, you know, he, he, he has to choose how he's going to be in the relationship. And unfortunately, most men end up being Baal. And then there's this, this tension. Now, I, I believe personally, I believe that God intended for a little bit of tension to be in marriage. It keeps things fresh. It keeps things stirred up. But, but it, it should never be a harmful, a stressful kind of thing. Um, I, I think there's this uh, stirring up that should take place in a marriage. Um, um, i trying to remember the name of the movie. Fireproof. Um, when he was doing the 40-day love dare, one of the things that they were talking about was studying your wife. Studying your wife. <coughs> you know, when you're, you're first getting together, you want to know about her. You want to know what makes her tick. You want to know the things that bless her, how you can bless her with things. Um, you know, I was really good at this. It only took me 20 years to figure out what Christy liked. Every, every birthday, every Christmas, every Mother's Day, I give her the things that I thought she should like. And then, you know, it clicked for me. I was projecting what I wanted on her. She, she would do the same with me. I, I will never forget the worst Christmas ever. <laughs> the worst Christmas ever. Every single thing she bought me was clothes. I hate getting clothes for her. Don't. Yeah, Just don't. Yeah. You want clothes for Christmas? That's okay. You get clothes for Christmas. I need clothes. I'm going to go to the store and buy myself a pair of jeans. Don't you wrap them up and put them in a box yeah. and tell me Merry Christmas or Happy Birthday. Yeah. Okay? Now, for those of you that like clothes, hey, more power to you. That's great. Every single thing I got was clothes. It was, it was heartbreaking. I was like a blue Christmas. Yeah. Okay? And she, she couldn't understand why I was upset. Okay? But, see, I, I do the same thing with her. You know, Christmas would come and I would buy her a book. I love to read. I would even try to find a book that I thought she would like. And, and she's like, oh, yay, thank you. Yeah. You know? So we, we've kind of worked out a special deal now. I give her a Christmas list. She gives me a Christmas list. Neither of us buy either anything off of the Christmas list, but we look to see the things that each other wants. And sometimes, for, for many years, what my Christmas gift to her was was gift cards. But that wasn't just the gift. The gift was I would go with her when she went to go buy her clothes. And we would go to the mall, and she'd go to the different shops, and I'd sit out with all the other husbands. <laughs> And then she let me know that this really didn't bless her. <laughs> oh, we're going to another store? Well, I'll just stay here. Okay. So, when you study your girlfriend, your fiancé, your wife, it should never stop happening. Because people change, don't they? Christy's gone through some really incredible changes in our lives. And I still, every once in a while, she'll do things that just, just shock me. Um, you know, when, when we were down in Mexico, um, God blessed us, I was able to buy her a ring. And I have never thought about buying her a ring because as far as I knew, she never wanted a ring. And I was actually looking at a, a necklace and she said, actually, what I'd really like is a ring. And I went, what? A ring? She said, yeah, I, I like rings. Since when? <laughs> when did this happen? I, I had no clue. She likes rings. So we got her a ring. You know, study, study, study. Learn your spouse. Okay, so we see this contention. We see this thing that, that uh, women are going to push for a position that is not theirs. Men have to choose what type of lordship they will have. Now, I want to get into the New Testament. I want to touch on a couple of things here real quick. Let me just make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Actually, I am. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to share with you. We talked a little bit last week about our understanding of the dynamic of relationships. 
and how as Americans, because we have never, uh, now I, I don't know about all of you guys, but I know during my lifetime, there have been no kings in the United States, okay? And I'm pretty sure during your lifetime, there have been no kings in the United States, okay? Um, we don't understand the significance or the impact of royalty. We, we really don't get it because um, we have a president and the president serves at our pleasure. And if we don't like the way the president is serving, at the end of the four years, we can choose to replace him with somebody else. And we, we have a nation where all men are equal. Some a little more equal than others. But, but you know, a, a constitutional republic guarantees that everybody has the same rights. Okay? So, we don't understand when Scripture talks about royalty. And when Scripture talks about hierarchy, we really don't understand it. Because we, we have this idea that if someone is higher up in hierarchy, they're better. But that's not the case at all, <coughs> is it? Because see, Scripture tells us that there is no Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free. That we are all equal in God's sight. Okay? Every one of us has the same value. Okay? We see when Jesus is talking about the parable of the talents, he gives three and two and one. And we would automatically assume that he thought, well, one, he likes better, right? Because he got three talents. I mean, the third dude, he only got one talent. But it says he gave each according to their ability. Okay? Now, um, Christy and I have very different methods of organization. Um, I, Christy tends to, by nature, be uh, a procrastinator. She, she tends to, well, I can, I can deal with that tomorrow. She, she's gotten a lot, a lot better. She makes lists everywhere. <coughs> she's always making lists so she can organize her thoughts and figure out what needs to be done when and where. I don't like to procrastinate, you know, on first day of college I get my syllabus, I'm looking down, I'm already starting to line out when I'm getting things done. So by the last day, I don't have to worry about anything, okay? And, and I like things orderly, but it's got to be my order, not her order, okay? So um, we're, we're very different in our nature. And uh, God talks about putting things in a certain order because he is a God of order. Okay, 1 Corinthians 14. And so we need to change our worldview. We got to quit thinking as Americans and we got to start thinking as Christians that we have been taken out of a nation of the United States. Now, we're still here, we still live here, we still have responsibilities here, but, but what we've been brought into is superior in every way. We are a holy nation. Not the United States of America. Christendom is a holy nation. And when you come into that nation, there's a different set of rules, there's a different set of governing. Okay? And we see that God has established an order such that everything would be accomplished in his plan. So, first thing we've got to do, we've got to get rid of this mindset that uh, higher is better and lower is worse. That's not true at all. Okay? It's simply not true. You've got to hear what I'm saying. Okay? God esteems the person in the church that cleans every bit as much as he esteems the one that talks. See, when, when God gives you value, nobody else can diminish that value. You understand that? Mm -hmm. do, do you understand that whatever your place in the kingdom, whatever your place in the body, God has given that value. 
Okay, so let's let's take a look at a couple of things here real quick. Um, we're going to jump from the Hebrew Bible into the New Testament. Uh, there's a couple of passages that I want to read real quick. I want to touch on some things. Um, oh, I see. I forgot. I, I forgot it again. Hang on. Genesis chapter 21. Turn there real quick. I got to hit this because this is the example that was given us. <clears throat> no. I'm sorry, uh, Genesis 18 first. Got to back up a little bit. So Genesis chapter 18, the Lord appears to Abraham, and Abraham brings him in as was customary. He invites him in to refresh themselves, to partake of a meal. Um, down in verse 9, I'm just going to read a little snippet of this. They said to him, this is the Lord and the angels that were with them, uh, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, <coughs> advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out, and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. Okay. So think about this for a minute. Uh, incredible promise, isn't it? I, I love how tactfully Scripture handles certain things. Uh, now, Abraham and Sarah were old. <laughs> Advanced in years. Just in case you were wondering, that's what old means. <laughs> According to scripture, you're advanced in years. It's a, it's a really crazy thing. I remember being young and looking at my parents and thinking they were old. And now my children, who are young, look at me and think I'm old. It's, a, it's a, just an amazing thing. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Wow. He, he's saying she can't have kids anymore. It's just not going to happen. Okay. Now, I want you to key on a word here. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? What does she call Abraham? Can you guess what word that is there? Adult. Adonai. She, she calls him Adonai. Now, we could leave this right here and just say, well, that's one of those weird things that, that scripture stuck in the Bible. But God didn't just stick weird things in his Bible. Everything in there has a purpose. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 3. Chapter 
chapter 3. We're actually going to deal with this uh, in a little more depth later, but I just want to point something out to you really quickly. Chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without, without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. When God repeats something, we've got to sit up and pay attention. Okay? Sarah is being used as an example of what is right, what is proper, and she referred to Abraham as Lord, as Adonai. In, in the, the Greek, it's kurios. Okay? She's calling him Lord. Now, we see a dynamic at work here uh, where God has established an order. We see that uh, um, Sarah has honored her husband by calling him Lord. So let me ask you a question here, just real quick. Was Sarah powerless? No. Was she powerless? I mean, think about it for a minute. Twice, they go into a foreign land, and her husband introduces her as his sister. Hi, I'm Abraham. This is my sister, Sarah. And twice, God intervened to protect Sarah. Twice, both times. Now, I'm not saying husbands that you should follow this pattern. What I'm saying is that God honored Sarah and kept her safe. And if that's not enough for you, we turn back to Genesis chapter 20. I'm just going to summarize real quick. Genesis chapter 20. A year has gone by, and Sarah's pregnant. Actually, she has Isaac. She's given birth. So the, the, the child of promise, as Galatians calls Isaac, he is the child of promise, has come to pass. Now, Sarah, we talked a little bit about how she manipulated her husband into trying to do something that he shouldn't have done, and that by giving her Hagar and Abraham's son Ishmael came out, and, and now Sarah has had a son, and Isaac is there, and Sarah looks at Ishmael harassing Isaac, and she tells her husband, he shall never share in the inheritance of my son. Send them away. <coughs> Abraham's heartbroken. Because Ishmael is his son. Now, he was the son of, of uh, not the promise, but he's still his son. And Abraham's distressed, and he calls out to God, and God says this. He says, don't worry about it. Do everything that your wife has told you. Send them on their way. For your sake, I am going to make of Ishmael a mighty nation. For Abraham's sake. But God stood up for Sarah and said to do what she has told you. Okay? Sarah was not powerless. She was not valueless. Her value was not diminished in any way because Abraham was Abraham and she was Sarah. As a matter of fact, we see that God holds her up as the paradigm for womanhood. Okay?